And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It is Tuesday, January the 10th, 2012. You're listening to today's edition of the Ugly Truth Podcast. And I guarantee, folks, after you hear what we have in store for you today, you will agree with me that it is a fine podcast. We have a very special guest. We are all honored, but especially I am honored to have him on. I've been following his work now for many years. In fact, I can remember specifically the moment at which I first crossed paths with, paths with today's guest. It was in Washington, D.C., I was at the, uh, univ- or the uh, uh, reunion of the USS Liberty Veterans, and a good friend of mine, a Muslim, a Pakistani Muslim, drove all the way down from New York uh, just to see me and handed me two DVDs. He said, you should watch these. I think that you would find them very enlightening. And indeed, I did pop these things into the computer and watch them and I was astounded folks at what I was listening to and I honestly folks if I sound a little bit nervous it's because I am a little bit uh, odd today to have today's guest on I've been chasing him around for some time I finally lassoed him and got him on the program Uh, his name is Sheikh Imran Hussein folks and if you don't know who he is then you certainly should because he's one of the few people out there who is providing a truthful and precise analysis and depiction of what is going on in our world today the reason why I asked Sheikh Hussein to come on the program is because he never fails to amaze me with whatever analysis he is giving on any particular topic whether it is Islam whether it is Christianity whether it is how Jesus and his Mary are depicted in the Islamic religion whether it is the Arab Spring just to give you an indication folks of what kind of mind we're dealing with here uh, Imran Hussein predicted the quote-unquote Arab revolution back in I believe it was 2003 just nod your head Imran if that's correct is that 2000 no he's shaking his head no okay he's going to set us straight once we bring him up (laughs) okay Uh, nevertheless he did predict it and he has predicted it very accurately as the fraud that it is now before I bring him up folks I'm going to set the stage here a little bit As those of you who listen to this program know, a few weeks ago I had the honor of going to Houston, Texas and speaking at at an Islamic conference there. Mainly Iranians, which means that they were for the most part Shia. And the speech that I gave them, I started off by telling them that I am a follower of the teachings of Jesus. I had to stipulate that I I did not want to call myself a Christian in their presence folks because so many people calling themselves Christians have murdered so many innocent people whether it's been in Iraq or Afghanistan or have allowed or facilitated the murder of innocent people in Gaza the West Bank Lebanon of course the thing that uh, ties all of these people together folks is that they are on Israel's hit list anyway the bulk of the speech the thrust of the speech that I gave in Houston was to tell the people there the Muslims in attendance that this quote unquote war on terror uh, is not a war to rob the people of the Middle East of their oil or to rob them of their natural gas or any other what we would call tangible natural resources okay the real reason for this war is to rob the people of the Middle East of their most precious commodity and that is their religion their way of life their culture their morals and that this is the battle line between the forces of good and evil 
And I will say that plainly as a follower of the teachings of Jesus. That the Christian world fell a long time ago, folks. It has morphed into a sick mutation of Jewish thinking. And except for a few pockets of resistance, for the most part, it is gone. The only thing that remains is the Islamic world. And it is specifically because the Islamic world refuses to bow down and to adopt these practices, whether they are moral, whether they are cultural, whether they are economic, whether they are political. This is the reason why we are dropping bombs on the countries of these innocent people to further this discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very honored to have with us Sheikh Imran Hussein. I know you told me, Imran, that I should not refer to you as Sheikh, but I think for purposes of uh, decorum here, at least let's start the program off that way. Thank you very much for coming on the program and welcome, sir. Thank you, Glenn, for your very kind <laughs> invitation. Well, I am here in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and it is nine o'clock in the morning and you were there in the east coast of the united states is after five in the afternoon and i'm honored to be on your program uh... you heard my uh, introduction imran that this war that is taking place is a spiritual battle uh... and it is mainly directed against what remains of the only standing resistance to zionist domination of the planet uh, would you agree with me on this, that this is not a war for natural resources as much as it is a war to destroy the last remaining uh, opposition to this thing known as the uh, Zionist or Jewish New World Order? Well, first of all, Glenn, the, the speech that I gave uh, in which I anticipated what is now known as the Arab Spring or the revolutions that would be sweeping the Arab world. Uh, that lecture was given in 2002, uh, not 2003, but you're not far from the, okay. from the map. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it, was given in, it was given in Sydney, Australia. Uh -huh. uh, the second point is I entirely agree with you in your analysis of the war and terror, but I wondered why did you leave out one special word? that uh, the war on terror is meant to not only rob us of this and that and the other but most of all to rob us of our freedom mm -hmm. uh, and number three I have to differ with you I don't think that Islam is the last force remaining in the world standing up to uh, evil forces which seek to oppress as never before in history and we seek to establish their own political and economic dominion over all of mankind on Israel's behalf. Okay. I believe that there is a part of the Christian world which uh, is resisting and will continue to resist. Uh, Christianity, when viewed from the perspective of the Quran, can be divided into two parts one part of the Christian world is that part which will make an alliance with the Jewish world okay. and that today has emerged in the Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance which is known as the West okay. and of which NATO is the military arm but there's another part of the Christian world both, both parts of the Christian world are referred to in the Quran as a Nasara, but the other part of the Christian world, the Quran tells us in the uh, chapter entitled Al Ma'ida, or the table laden with food, and the verse should be around verse number 80, 85, or somewhere around there. Latajidanna, wa latajidanna akrabahum mawaddatan lilladheena amanu lilladheena qalu inna Nasara. The Quran is saying that you will most certainly, you will most certainly find in time to come 
those amongst mankind who will be closest to you, Muslims, in love and affection, will be those who say, we are Christians. That part of the Christian world is also referred to in the Quran as room. Room. <laughs> Unfortunately, the word room is so close to the, the name of the city Rome that is sometimes understood as Rome, not Rome, mm -hmm. rather it's Rome. And Rome is very, very clearly the Eastern Byzantine Christian Empire, mm -hmm. which used to have its capital in Constantinople. Uh, that Christian, Eastern Christian Byzantine Empire has not aligned itself with the Jewish world in a Christian Jewish alliance is the Western one. Mm -hmm. And uh, that room today is to be found in Russia mm -hmm. and in the East European states. And uh, Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, has in fact prophesied that the world of Islam is going to enter into an alliance with Rome. Mm -hmm. And that alliance is in the making now, I believe. Uh, uh, Iran is uh, very close to uh, Russia, uh, growing close all the time. Uh, Ch Pakistan has now begin, begun to learn some bitter lessons and Pakistan has already applied for a membership in the, I don't know what's the name of that pact with Russia and China. And the Russians have supported the Pakistani apply, application. Uh, and I am anticipating civil war in Turkey. Um, one, once, once NATO makes its future move after that disastrous NATO move in, uh, in Libya where all the NATO underwear is now on display, dirty underwear mm -hmm. for that. Uh, it's creating resentment in Turkey. And uh, when NATO makes its move in other parts of the world, I expect an, an attack on Pakistan almost certain, uh, an attack on Iran, uh, an attack on Egypt in time to come. Uh, resentment in Turkey is going to grow to such an intensity that I anticipate civil war in Turkey. And in that civil war, the side which is opposed to NATO is going to ent enter into an alliance similar to Iran and Pakistan with Russia, with the Russian-led alliance. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that we can, we can conclude that Islam is the only force left in the world today. Mm -hmm. Standing up to Zionist uh, uh, um, oppression, but rather that there is a second force clearly discernible from the Quran, and that is the Eastern Christian uh, church known as Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, and thirdly, amongst the rest of mankind, we see people with the kind of integrity and courage of uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and the Venezuelan masses who support him. And people like um, uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia mm -hmm. and the Bolivian masses who support him. Mm -hmm. And in other parts of Latin America. Um, so. It is not an entirely lost cause, and we are not alone. Mm -hmm. Well, I, as a Christian, I'm certainly glad to hear you say that, <laughs> because uh, uh, it, it looks pretty bleak from where uh, we are sitting here, in the United States particularly. Uh, the, the moral and political situation just continues to break down. I'm sure that you've been following the news coming out of the primaries for uh, the Republican nomination, and... The uh, at least at this point, all the front runners are people who have already sworn themselves uh, over to the side of Israel, over the side of war. Uh, you know, the American people, and and again, I, I have to base mo most of what I'm saying here on the fact that I am living in the United States, and I can only judge uh, based upon what I see in my immediate surroundings. The people in the United States, uh, when it comes to understanding their world, where it is going, uh, how it is falling apart and breaking apart. Uh, they have absolutely uh, no knowledge of this, awareness of this uh, of whatsoever. Their country is bankrupt because of these wars, uh, morally bankrupt, of course, because of the uh, control of uh, mass media and, and, by extension, control of our culture. 
uh, by a certain group of people who have already demonstrated themselves to be uh, adversely uh, against us in our interests. Uh, so, but at the same time, I, I can see what you're saying with regards to uh, the Eastern Christians. However, uh, the, I've, I have been to Europe. I have seen what it is like uh, morally and culturally uh, they are in much the same situation that we are. Their banking system is still uh, uh, hooked up or hinged to the same type of uh, Jewish banking system that we have here in the United States. So uh, in your estimation, Imran, how is it that the East is going to deliver itself from the jaws of death? Is it going to be because it throws its uh, fortunes in with the Russians? Uh, well, I was not speaking of that part of Europe, which can be described as Western Europe. Mm -hmm. I was speaking of that part of Europe, which better be described as Eastern Europe, where you don't have the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, rather you have the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church. Um, in order for us to, to answer you, I think we have to take our discussion to a deeper level now, okay. and that is to try to to fathom the reality of one of the most uh, mysterious events which has ever occurred in human history, uh, and that is the emergence of what is now called modern Western civilization. Mm -hmm. It is an absolutely unique event in all of human history. It cannot be explained with the normal tools of political and economic analysis. There's nothing there in the data which can explain the emergence of this civilization. It is not, we are not experiencing just a clash of civilization between Islam and the West. I think it's much more than that. There is the need to fathom the reality of modern Western civilization, which for the first time in human history seeks to establish its dominion over the entire world, mm -hmm. over the entire landmass, over the sea, over the air. Uh, in 19, in the 19, probably in the 1940s, the famous British historian Arnold Toynbee published his famous book uh, entitled Civilization on Trial. It's a good book to read. Mm -hmm. And in that book this famous historian looked across the ages and looked into the future and, and wrote these, these memorable lines that modern Western civilization has an agenda to establish its total dominion over all of the world, the land, the sea, the air. And this is precisely what we are witnessing and we have been witnessing for a long time. What is there which explains this phenomenon? Why has it emerged and where is it taking the world to? Uh, my opinion, Glenn, and of course people are free to defer with me, my opinion, Glenn, is that we have to turn beyond politics and economics uh, and sociology to a branch of knowledge that we know of as eschatology mm -hmm. to explain the emergence of modern Western civilization. Uh, and our eschatology from the viewpoint of Islam is that this is a sign of what we may call the end time. Uh, secular scholarship, I don't think secular scholarship has a conception of the end time because it is entirely materialistic. It's wedded to this world that we can observe. It has no conception of another world beyond human observation. Uh, but from the viewpoint of religion, we we have a conception of an end time in which history is going to end. Uh, the end of history is most certainly not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. We have a conception of the end of the world where everything, including the Statue of Liberty, 
will be turned to ashes, mm -hmm. everything will be transformed and uh, we will then be, and thank God for that, thank God for that, thank God for that, everyone will be resurrected, resurrected and then you will have to answer for even the minutest act that you perform. Mm -hmm. The minutest act of goodness and of virtue uh, and of resistance to oppression, all the tears of the African slaves, the innocent African slaves who labored and toiled in the Americans, in the Americas, all their blood and all their tears will come forth on that day for justice. All the blood and the tears of the innocent Indian people who lived in the Americas and who were butchered, butchered like cockroaches, mm -hmm they also will re-emerge re on that day and every act of evil will have to be accounted for. That's the end of the world, that's the judgment. Mm -hmm. On our perspective there is another end which is the end of history and that comes prior to the end of the world and the end of history will witness the final, the final confrontation between the forces of truth and falsehood, mm -hmm. the forces of justice and injustice and oppression. And the perspective of religion is that history cannot end without the triumph of truth over falsehood and thank God for that. That end of history comes when Jesus, the son of Mary, returns to the world. Mm -hmm. The Quran is clear. The Quran is clear that when they claim that they killed him and they boasted of it and they claim that they crucified him and they boasted of it and if it was not there in the Quran they'd arrest me for anti-Semitism. When they made these claims they were now confident that he could not have been the Messiah, mm -hmm. the promised Messiah, who when he comes would rule the world. And since the promised Messiah would be a prophet sent to the Israelite people, they assumed that with his advent they would once again rule the world. Mm -hmm. That's their mistake. When he came, however, some of them accepted him, but the establishment rejected him and still rejects him to this day. And uh, since they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, they were convinced that he could not have been the Messiah because he's dead, he never ruled the world. Mm -hmm. The golden age never came back. And so they're waiting for the Messiah to come. And at this point in time, Netanyahu is not the most important person in Israel. All of Israel is waiting for the Messiah, mm -hmm. who they assume is just around the corner. Mm -hmm. But our prophet told us, our prophet told us that Almighty God created a being and to use computer language programmed that being to impersonate the Messiah, the divine wisdom at work in such a wonderful way. And that false Messiah would give them, take them for a ride. He would deceive them into believing that he is indeed the true Messiah. And in order for him to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, the son of Mary, then the false Messiah would also have to do a number of things. He would have to, he would have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews, which is on the Muslim route. Mm -hmm. And he's already done that. He'd have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, 2,000 years after they were expelled. And he's already done that. Mm -hmm. You would have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get them to believe that this is Holy Israel of David and of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And he's already done that. 
And he had to cause that Israel to grow, to become a superpower. He's already done that. Israel is today controlling the American Congress. Mm -hmm. Today, <laughs> Israel controls Obama. And he's already done that. And he'll have to cause that Israel to become the ruling state in the world, in the sense in which Britain was once the ruling state. And then the United States replaced Britain as the ruling state in the bad sense of the world. Israel will have to replace the United States and become the third and final ruling state of this stage of history, the end of history. Mm -hmm. And we are out to witness that. Modern Western civilization emerged in history in this context as a creation which was designed to facilitate the movement towards that end of history in which Israel will establish its political and dominion, economic dominion, first of all over the Arabs, mm -hmm. and that's the wars on the Arabs are taking place now, and then over the, all of mankind. And at that time he will emerge in, his, in Israel, ruling over Israel. Uh, he will be a Jew. Uh, the Christian know him as the Antichrist. Uh, I think you referred to him as the Anti-Messiah, you know. Someone else. Antichrist. Uh, an Antichrist, yeah. Um, no, someone in Mexico wrote to me, a very famous man in Mexico, let me not mention his name. And uh, he referred to him as the anti messiah. Mm -hmm. um, so, my, my view is that we are probably not more than about 20, 25 years away mm -hmm. from that event when this man who the Prophet Muhammad described. Uh, 1400 years ago, he would be a Jew, he would be a young man, indicating that the young people are going to rule the world tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And he would be, he would be powerfully built, he'd have curly hair, and from Jerusalem he's going to declare that he is the Messiah, because he would be. It is at that time when he declares that he is the Messiah, and he's taken all the Zionists for a ride, and more importantly, he's taken the Oriental Jews for a ride not the European Jews who are not Semitic at all. They don't even have one blood, one, one drop of Senate, mm -hmm. Semitic blood in them. Mm -hmm. It's Oriental Jews who are Semites. It is at that time, and not one moment before, it is at that time that history is going to witness this phenomenal event that the universities don't talk about, the return of Jesus, the son of Mary, who will then dispatch the false messiah into a state of non-existence. Mm -hmm. So the false messiah is not a human being, he's not an angel, he's not a jinn, but he's going to appear in the form of a human being. Angels can appear as human beings, Gabriel did, the jinn can appear as human beings, and so the Antichrist is going to appear in the form of a human being. And uh, this, this kind of cosmology is not at all taught in universities. Mm -hmm. So the modern educated mind has no knowledge of this. Mm -hmm. And then after the Antichrist is dispatched into non-existence, Israel will disappear from the map. It will be, it'll be destroyed by an army which will come out of Khorasan, said the Prophet, mm -hmm. God bless him. Khorasan, Afghanistan is the heart of Khorasan. It's the one part of the world that modern Western civilization has never been able to colonize. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. From that part of the world where Western civilization has never been able to establish roots, that an army will come out and it will be unstoppable on its march directly to Jerusalem. At that point in time, said the Prophet, you will fight the Jews and you will defeat them. Not all Jews, of course, that's lazy analysis, mm -hmm. lazy methodology to think that the Prophet is speaking about all Jews, not at all. You will fight the Jews, meaning those Jews who are oppressors, mm -hmm. and you will defeat them. And at that time, he said, even the stones and the trees will speak and say, Muslim, 
there's a Jew hiding behind me, so come and kill him. Meaning, the oppressor. So, this, the holy state of Israel will then be restored, and this imposter would vanish away. And truth will then triumph over falsehood and justice over tyranny and oppression. That's the end of history. And so what we're seeing now is not just a clash of civilizations, but rather the emergence of modern Western civilization as part and parcel of a process leading to that end of history. It is playing a sinister role in history and we have to uh, turn to eschatology to understand that role. That's the macro picture from which we can now turn to micro analysis about Arab Spring and so on. Well, you know, uh, Imran, uh, uh, addressing what you're talking about here with, with regards to eschatology, uh, I'm sure you're aware that the Christians have their own version of this in their uh, final chapter of their Bible, the, the book of the Apocalypse, and uh, it is described, the, the very same thing that you're describing is described in the Christian Bible in the sense that there are two beasts, uh, one of which, you know, it's it's obviously very allegorical and, and metaphorical and symbolic, you know, that it has all of these heads and it has all of these horns and other uh, uh, ways of waging war against uh, mankind and against God. Uh, and sitting atop this beast that is waging war is this woman who is dressed in scarlet and gold and uh, she, it says that she is drunk on the blood of the saints. And so... You know, uh, w what you as a Muslim are saying, according to Muslim prophecy, basically corresponds, although certainly in, in much more understandable uh, detail uh, from your standpoint, it basically corresponds to what uh, the, the Christian Bible says as well. Unfortunately, of course, as you well know, uh, our, our priests and our preachers and pastors have perverted these prophecies in order, in order to help facilitate these very evil things that are taking place. And, uh, and so, having said that, I guess we should just uh, jump right into discussing the Arab Spring. But before we do, uh, there, there's something that uh, caught my ear that you said, not just today, but in a, a recent uh, broadcast that you did, which is that Israel plans to see the United States destroyed. And this is something that I have tried to hammer home uh, in these various broadcasts that I've done, which is that once the United States has uh, done its job of, of going about the world and killing as many Muslims as possible, uh, at, at that point, once we have exhausted ourselves economically, militarily, politically, culturally, and, and every other way, then Israel will emerge as a world power. This isn't just about uh, these wars are not just about poor little Israel surviving. These wars are about bringing down the United States uh, so that Israel can emerge as a world power. Would you care to comment on that, please? Yes, but I will not use the word destroy the United States. Rather, replace the United States. Okay. Mm -hmm. be a more proper term. And in order for Israel... Uh, to replace, uh, in order for Pax Judaica to replace Pax Americana, mm -hmm. we have to look to see what was the process through which Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica. Mm -hmm. These are th these are terms which belong to international relations, and they are begging for an explanation. How did they come into being? What is it that explains this phenomenon of Pax Britannica, the emergence of Pax Britannica? After all, you would recall that Napoleon referred to the British, he referred to the British contemptuously as a nation of shopkeepers. Mm -hmm. And yet this nation of shopkeepers rose so mysteriously in the world that by 1914, when the First World War was about to commence, with, of course, naturally so, an act of terrorism, a false flag act of terrorism. The blame was put on this one, when in fact the hidden hands behind it were the ones who were responsible for engineering the assassination of the Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then you have another act of false flag terrorism on 9-11. And the blame is put on these people, whereas the hidden hands behind are the CIA and the Israeli Mossad. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that explains the emergence of Pax Britannica and Pax Americana? We say the explanation lies in eschatology. And that in order for this process to reach culmination, a Pax Judaica has to seek to replace Pax Americana. But Pax Americana did not come about with the destruction of Pax Britannica. Yes, Pax Britannica no longer exists. Britain is no longer a ruling state in the world. But Britain is still, by all means, a very powerful country. And Britain wields a considerable amount of influence around the world. In, in fact, the British have been the world's most successful colonial power. Mm -hmm. Far more successful than the Russians, far more successful than the Germans, far so more successful than the Italians and the Dutch have been the British and after the British the French. You have something called the, the Commonwealth today where all the former territories which were ruled by Britain as loyal, loyal subjects. <laughs> now they're independent states but they all dress up in their jackets and ties and come together in a Commonwealth conference called the Commonwealth Summit. Mm -hmm. This is British diplomacy at its finest. So Britain still commands a significant, a significant amount of influence in the world today. But Britain is no longer the ruling state. That was very plain and clear when Anthony Eden had to resign as Prime Minister of Britain in 1956, I think it was, when Dwight Eisenhower ordered them, get out of Suez, get out of Sinai. And Britain, France and Israel had to withdraw. Mm -hmm. And uh, the British Prime Minister resigned, the British government fell. Similarly, I believe we have to use a method of um, analogical reasoning here to anticipate what is the fate which now awaits the United States of America. It's one similar to what ex was experienced by Britain. That the United States is going to fall in the sense that the US dollar will collapse. It's not collapsing by accident, not at all. The, the, the United States is experiencing a planned and uh, an incremental, deliberate demolition mm -hmm. of the U.S. dollar. And it is taking place in order that the U.S. economy would also collapse. The United States, the white Americans are going to lose a large portion of their wealth. Black America hardly has anything. Um, but more than that, I am anticipating, because of my eschatological um, analysis, that the United States has to be tricked or trapped in a military adventure in which it is going to face defeat. And that in the same way that Britain was facing defeat in 1917, was it? Britain was on the verge of defeat. The, the German submarines had marooned Britain and I think Britain had about two weeks left of food. Uh, it was at that time that the United States intervened in the war and eventually Germany was defeated. Mm -hmm. It was then plain and clear that the process of transformation of change was on the way from Britain to the United States as a ruling state. And then of course after that came Bretton Woods, which formalized the transfer from the sterling pound to the US dollar. And then came, as I said, 1956 with the humiliation of the British lion with his tail between his leg. Uh, so perhaps, uh, Glenn, perhaps we're going to see the same phased mm -hmm. um, methodology but perhaps it's going to be accelerated. Mm -hmm. um, with the U.S. dollar, well, the U.S. dollar has already collapsed. I believe it's in ICU in some hospital in Manhattan. Um, but with, with, perhaps with an attack on Iran, you would see the price of oil 
escalating and the price of gold escalating and of course that will imply the falling value of the dollar to such an extent that I believe the US dollar is going to be demonetized. You can't use it as, as money anymore. And they will replace it with something else which they probably have in place already. We should have a fraction of the value of the present dollar. And as you change your old money for the new one, you're going to lose a large portion of your wealth. Um, I anticipate riots in the United States when this happens. And a lot of hatred mm -hmm. and a lot of hostility against Jews, but the media is going to try to put the blame on Muslims mm -hmm. and the media is going to try to put the blame on a certain black man in the White House. Mm -hmm. convenient to have a <laughs> it's convenient to have a black man in the White House at such an event mm -hmm. when the US, US economy sure, collapses. Sure. Now, what, what, could be the, what could be the trap for the United States? Um, I find it uh, very, very, very interesting indeed that at just that moment when the United States seems is resigned to the fact that it cannot prevent Israel from launching an attack on Iran, uh, the United States understands an attack on Iran will immediately provoke Iran to attack American troops in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And the United States will not have a single friend, a single friend left in Iraq. Entire Iraqi population would be against the United States, plus the Iranian troops coming from over the border. That would be a hopeless situation. Mm -hmm. The United States is going to face such a situation in Iraq with body bags being flown back to the United States and the American people rising up that what they did, very, very interestingly so, is to pull out of Iraq suddenly, overnight. They're out of Iraq, indicating that they are anticipating a situation where they mm -hmm. could face military defeat in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Of course, they, they cover this up now by sending troops to Israel as a cover-up. But the fact is that they are out of Iraq because they will not be able to stand up to Iran in a ground war. And there's just that many people you can kill from the air, after which the whole world will turn against you. Mm -hmm. So you can't win the war from the air. You have to face a ground war. And they don't want to face a ground war against Iran in a situation where nobody will support them. Nobody. You see? So they have escaped from defeat in Iraq. They're out of that trap. Well, then where could the other trap be? Um, I am, again, I can be wrong then, but I believe that Israel would want Iran to retaliate by taking Bahrain. Mm -hmm. Israel would certainly not want to deliver a knockout blow to Iran, not at all. Israel will want to deliver a blow to Iran sufficiently strong to provoke war and to provoke a series of war but to keep Iran still strong because the, the strike on Iran is meant to deliver a number of things to Israel ultimately the rule over the world so you have to provoke a number of wars so if Israel, if Israel can entice Iran into taking Bahrain the island of Bahrain that will pose an immediate threat to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. There's a causeway between Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. You can drive over. And uh, at that time, I believe, in fact, I already believe that Saudi Arabia and Iran, Israel, uh, are in very intense secret uh, alliance. Uh, and both Saudi Arabia and Israel are planning the fall of the United States. Um, so Saudi Arabia will then call on the United States to come in and intervene to save the Saudis. And the Zionists in the U.S. Congress are going to make sure that Obama and the U.S. armed forces cannot stop them. And so U.S. forces will enter into Saudi Arabia against their will, really, to save Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. But when they come into Saudi Arabia to save Saudi Arabia, I think the plan, the plan is for Israel for Iran to give them a sound beating. Mm -hmm. I think that's the plan. The Saudis want that to happen and the Israelis want that to happen. 
And when the United States has been sucked into the trap uh, on, on the verge taking a good beating, the only force in the world who can then intervene to save the United States would be Israel. Right. And similarly, as the only force in the world that could have intervened to save Britain was the United States. And so history will repeat itself. Mm. That's the micro analysis. Fascinating. Uh, let's bring this uh, forward to the events that we are seeing take place now vis-a-vis -vis the Arab Spring. Now, uh, as you pointed out, uh, you predicted this back in 2002, that you would see, that the world would see these fantastic things with the assistance of Al Jazeera, you know, Al Jazeera, of course, uh, carrying the appearance of being a, a Middle Eastern network that the Arabs could believe in, that they could trust. Uh, that you would see these fantastic things taking place with Arabs uh, rising up and, and throwing off the shackles of uh, imperialist and colonialist powers that have been sitting on top of them now for the last uh, half century. Um, I, it has been my contention from the be very beginning that this was just an extension of, of Israel's uh, bigger plans for the Middle East, that these were not real revolutions that were taking place. Uh, but I'm sure that you will do a much better job explaining this to our listeners than I would. So if you would please, uh, Imran, take it from there. Well, I think you're right, Glenn, in your analysis that the revolutions are intended to facilitate Israeli agenda mm -hmm. of eventual world domination. How will this take place? Um, I gave that speech in 2002 anticipating an American attack on Iraq, which did take place in 2003, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the Arab Spring would have taken place in 2003. I was wrong. <laughs> and I thought that the first country that would fall would be Jordan. And I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy, Glenn, to be wrong sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to be wrong sometimes. It, 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 it keeps my feet on the sand, on the dirt, on the, on the dust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the analysis was that uh, Israel wants to provoke these revolutions out of a sense of Arab, utter Arab frustration at oppression, mm -hmm. utter Arab frustration at this, the, the, the persecution of Muslims, war on the religion, uh, so that these revolutions, these uprisings would result in Islamic forces emerging in leadership position. Mm -hmm. So that the secular nationalist Arab leadership would be swept away. That secular nationalist Arab leadership from the time of uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt mm -hmm. and uh, Muhammad Mossadegh in, uh, in Iran and so on and uh, Ahmad Sokarno in Indonesia, um, Muhammad Ali Jinnah in Pakistan, that secular nationalist leadership had a very important role to play in the plan and it played that role successfully. Mm -hmm. It was no longer needed. In the same way, we don't need paper currencies anymore. Paper currencies have performed the job that they were designed to perform and they don't need them anymore. So paper currencies are now going to disappear to re be replaced with electronic money, which is, of course, the equivalent of a financial Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the secular nationalist leadership of the Arab world is no longer needed. Mo uh, what's his name? Hosni Mubarak has done his dirty work for us. We don't need him anymore. What we need now is Islamic leadership, or so-called Islamic leadership so that the world would see Muslims in the name of Islam ruling over Egypt, for example, an Islamic government in Egypt. 
what, how will Israel benefit from an Islamic government in Egypt, which of course is around the corner. Mm -hmm. the elections have already taken place mm -hmm. and the Islamic parties have won the elections outright. My answer is that the Islamic parties, when they take power in these countries, whether they like it or whether they don't, would be forced to, uh, to increase vocally and tangibly mm -hmm. their support for the Palestinians. Yes. And in particular for the plight of the people of Gaza. Mm -hmm. And as they increase that support and they enter into tangible support and the rhetoric increases, the rhetoric of war, Israel and the media around the world can then launch a PR program a PR offensive to captivate mankind with this lie that Islam poses a threat to mankind, it's a menace to mankind. Mm -hmm. Muslims want to take over the whole world mm -hmm. and Israel is in mortal, mortal danger. Uh, Israel already has her pre-planned wars against the Arabs, for example, but Israel does not want to wage these wars while appearing as a naked aggressor. Exactly. So Israel wants to be able to say, well, we are only defending ourselves and we are waging these wars on behalf of mankind, to save mankind from the menace mm -hmm. of Islam. That's my explanation of the Arab uprising. But there's another part of it. There's another part of it, and that is that, uh, and I am I am actually mentioning this for the first time in your your program, Glenn, mm -hmm. uh, that Islamic political theory, Islamic political theory, is one which recognizes divine sovereignty over the state. Western political theory, the modern state has rejected divine sovereignty. Sovereignty now lies with the people. Mm -hmm. And the modern constitution around the world recognizes sovereignty of the state residing with the people. And that supreme authority and supreme law resides with parliament, not with God and his prophet. And these Islamic parties in the Arab world and elsewhere are monstrously misguided pathetically misguided and finally sorrowfully misguided that they do not have an understanding of Western political theory mm -hmm. and they foolishly, they foolishly, Glenn, I'm sorry to be using this harsh language but the walls are falling down, Glenn, the fire is consuming the house, I have to use the language now. Mm -hmm. They very foolishly take an Islamic movement and transform it into a political party. Mm -hmm. with slogans and with party symbols and and then fight elections. Mm -hmm. Elections in which the population is recognized to be a conglomeration of individuals. Mm -hmm. No, no, God didn't create us as individuals. No, he has more wisdom than that. The divine wisdom <laughs> never created us as a world of individuals. Mm -hmm. No. Divine wisdom created us as a world of nations and tribes. And once we were nations and tribes, there was more cohesiveness in society. Today, society is falling apart. We are living in a world that is disintegrating mm -hmm. socially. Mm -hmm. And the political system is one in which the unit of the state would not be the individual. Mm -hmm. No. The unit of the state is the nation of the tribe. The nation of the tribe conducts its consultations within the tribe in a very refined way in which age and maturity and wisdom and experience have pre precedence over youth and over inexperience. And you can't buy elections. No, you can't use glitter, glitz and glitter and pomp and and, and, and the news media to, to brainwash people to vote for this one or that one, not in this political system. Mm -hmm. And so the nation and the tribe and the clan 
will hold its own internal consultations on matters pertaining to political leadership. And then the nation or the tribe will become the unit of the state. And that unit of the state will then express itself in the decision-making process through which the leadership is established or the leadership is replaced. That political system not only establishes stability, political and social stability, but sustains that stability. And this one has only created wars and conflicts and rivalry and tribal rivalry and bloodshed and murder all over the world. Mm -hmm. And of course the corruption of the political process. So the Islamic political parties in Egypt and in other parts of the Arab world are monstrously misguided and sorrowfully misguided in this um, process of theirs in which they register themselves as a political party and fight the elections. And the, the Western world has succeeded and is continuing to succeed in its plans to subvert Islam in this way. Mm -hmm. Um, there's more to the analysis, but I'm f I feel I'm taking too much of your time. Well, actually, uh, you know, I promised to only keep you uh, captive for an hour, but I, I do want to bolster what you said, because uh, particularly in the case of Egypt, we, we had the head of the IDF just last week giving a speech at an Israeli high school where he was uh, doing his usual business of uh, reminding the students that they are approaching military service age and not to forget to sign up, you know, and put on their uniform. But he also said something very important. He said that the Arab Revolution, the Arab Spring, has been a quote-unquote disaster for Israel, and it has brought us back to the situation that existed in 1967. Well, to anybody who has not studied the history of what took place, that may not make much sense, but to those who know what happened in 67, which is that Israel set up a situation where she was being threatened on all sides by Egypt, by Jordan, by uh, Syria, and then, of course, Israel preemptively uh, launched military operations against these countries for the sole purpose of stealing more land. And so what Benny Gantz was basically doing was choreographing to the entire world that Israel is setting up, through the use of these Arab revolutions, is setting up the same situation so that she can, as you said, uh, Imran, so that she can go before the world blameless and say, you know, we're only defending ourselves. We're just trying to protect ourselves against these bloodthirsty Muslims. You can't reason with them. Uh, they just hate us because we're Jews. And as you pointed out, very important, Imran, Israel wants to be able to take the credit for having, quote-unquote, saved the world from radical Islam. Yes, I, I believe you are correct there, Glenn. Um, uh, this is the art of deception, the diplomacy of deception. Uh, but truth must triumph over falsehood at the end of the day. And so there's my voice and the other voices. We may be small voices, but the Lord above can cause this voice to reach many and open the hearts and open the minds of many to understand the reality which is so different from the appearance of what is now taking place. Yes, and I agree with you Imran. Uh, as the Quran says, uh, they plotted but God is the wisest of all plotters and as far as I'm concerned they can make their plans and they can do their evil but at the end of the day uh, the Lord who created all will have the final word, uh, the final say on everything. And in the meantime, all I can say is that it has been a great privilege and honor to take part in this fulfillment of what you have described as Islamic prophecy, that, uh, that there will be some Christians and some Muslims who get together against the forces of evil. I, I feel that uh, this program has been a very small but a very uh, important step in helping to bring that about. Glenn, I would like to conclude by thanking you for your kind invitation to be on your show and uh, to enter into the record my appreciation and uh, my sense of honor that I was privileged to speak with someone who describes himself as a friend of Islam. 
Uh, not all of mankind can be brainwashed with the propaganda offensive against Islam and the war on Islam that is raging around the world today and in which television and radio and newspapers are playing the most prominent and evil role. And I do hope and pray that this broadcast of yours will reach the, uh, the, the minds and the hearts of many around the world who similarly will take the same position towards Islam that you have taken, which is one of integrity. And I pray that there may be, le may be blessings for you in this. Thank you, Ben. If you would please, sir, uh, just sit tight for a second. I am going to close out the program, but I want to talk you off the air. And there you go, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it here on this Tuesday, January 10th, 2012 edition of the Ugly Truth Podcast. I want to thank my very uh, brilliant and esteemed guest, Imran Hossein. You can reach or you can read his works and watch his videos by going to imranhossein.org. That's H O S E I N. And ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you will not be disappointed. Uh, literally, if it weren't for the fact that I had to worry about the backlash that would definitely ensue from my wife, I would sit and watch these videos all day long. <laughs> but anyway, that's it for today, folks. As we are fond of saying on this program, go out and do what you can to save what is left of this damaged and dying world. If not for yourself, then certainly for those who are going to be inheriting the whole mess. And as always, ladies and gentlemen. Ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Tuhanku, aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu Tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup Sanera kamu dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku ampunkanlah dosaku sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa dosa besar.
can be divided into two parts. One part of the Christian world is that part which will make an alliance with the Jewish world. Okay. And that today has emerged in the Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance, which is known as the West. Okay. And of which NATO is the military arm. But there's another part of the Christian world. Both, both parts of the Christian world are referred to in the Quran as a Nasara. But the other part of the Christian world, the Quran tells us in the a chapter entitled Al Ma'ida or the table laden with food and the verse should be around verse number 80, 85 or somewhere around there. Uh Latajidanna Akarabahum Mawaddatan Lilladina Amanul Ladina Palu Inna Nasara. The Quran is saying that you will most certainly you will most certainly find in time to come those amongst mankind will be closest to you Muslims in love and affection will be those who say we are Christians that part of the Christian world is also referred to in the Quran as room room <laughs> unfortunately the word room is so close to the, the name of the city Rome that is sometimes understood as Rome not mm -hmm. Rome mm -hmm. rather it's Rome and Rome is very very clearly the Eastern Byzantine Christian Empire mm -hmm. which used to have its capital in Constantinople uh, that Christian Eastern Christian Byzantine Empire has not aligned itself with the Jewish world in a Christian Jewish alliance is the Western one mm -hmm. and uh, that room today is to be found in Russia mm -hmm. and in the East European states and uh, Prophet Muhammad Allah's blessings be upon him has in fact prophesied yeah. and it is nine o'clock in the morning and you were there in the East Coast of the United States is after five in the afternoon and I'm honored to be on your program uh, you heard my uh, introduction, Imran, that this war that is taking place is a spiritual battle uh, and it is mainly directed against what remains of the only standing resistance to Zionist domination of the planet. Uh, would you agree with me on this, that this is not a war for natural resources as much as it is a war to destroy the last remaining uh, opposition to this thing known as the uh, Zionist or Jewish New World Order? Well, first of all, Glenn, the, the speech that I gave uh, in which I anticipated what is now known as the Arab Spring or the revolutions that would be sweeping the Arab world, uh, that lecture was given in 2002, uh, not 2003, but you're not far from the Okay. <laughs> okay. It was given. In, it was given in Sydney, Australia. Uh huh. Uh, the second point is, I entirely agree with you in your analysis of the war and terror. But I wondered why did you leave out one special word that uh, the war and terror is meant to not only rob us of this and that and the other, but most of all to rob us of our freedom. Mm hmm. Uh, and number three, I have to differ with you. I don't think that Islam is the last force remaining in the world standing up to uh, evil forces which seek to oppress as never before in history and which seek to establish their own political and economic dominion over all of mankind on Israel's behalf. Okay. I believe that there is a part of the Christian world which uh, is resisting and will continue to resist. Uh, Christianity, when viewed from the perspective of the Quran, truthful and precise analysis and depiction of what is going on in our world today. The reason why I asked Sheikh. Hossein to come on the program is because 
he never fails to amaze me with whatever analysis he is giving on any particular topic, whether it is Islam, whether it is Christianity, whether it is how Jesus and his Mary are depicted in the Islamic religion, whether it is the Arab Spring. Just to give you an indication, folks, of what kind of mind we're dealing with here, uh, Imran Hussein predicted the quote-unquote Arab Revolution back in, I believe it was 2003. Just nod your head, Imran, if that's correct. Is that 2000? No, he's shaking his head no. Okay, he's going to set us straight once we bring him up. <laughs> Okay. Uh, nevertheless, he did predict it, and he has predicted it very accurately as the fraud that it is. Now, before I bring him up, folks, I'm going to set the stage here a little bit. As those of you who listen to this program know, a few weeks ago I had the honor of going to Houston, Texas, and speaking at, a, an, at an Islamic conference there. Mainly Iranians which means that they were, for the most part, Shia. And the speech that I gave them, I started off by telling them that I am a follower of the teachings of Jesus. I had to stipulate that. I, I did not want to call myself a Christian in their presence, folks, because so many people calling themselves Christians have murdered so many innocent people, whether it's been in Iraq or Afghanistan or have allowed or facilitated the murder of innocent people in Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon. Of course, the thing that uh, ties all of these people together, folks, is that they are on Israel's hit list. Anyway, the bulk of the speech, the thrust of the speech, And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It is Tuesday, January the 10th, 2012. You're listening to today's edition of the Ugly Truth Podcast. And I guarantee, folks, after you hear what we have in store for you today, you will agree with me that it is a fine podcast. We have a very special guest. We are all honored, but especially I am honored to have him on. I've been following his work now for many years. In fact, I can remember specifically the moment at which I first crossed paths with, paths with today's guest. It was in Washington, D.C. I was at the, uh, univ or the uh, reunion of the USS Liberty Veterans, and a good friend of mine, a Muslim, a Pakistani Muslim, drove all the way down from New York uh, just to see me and handed me two DVDs. He said, you should watch these. I think that you would find them very enlightening. And indeed, I did pop these things into the computer and watch them, and I was astounded, folks, at what I was listening to. And I honestly, <laughs> folks, if I sound a little bit nervous, it's because I am a little bit uh, odd today to have today's guest on. I've been chasing him around for some time. I finally lassoed him and got him on the program. Uh, his name is Sheikh Imran Hussein, folks, and if you don't know who he is, then you certainly should, because he's one of the few people out there who is providing a speech that I gave in Houston, was to tell the people there, the Muslims in attendance, that this quote-unquote war on terror uh, is not a war to rob the people of the Middle East of their oil or to rob them of their natural gas or any other what we would call tangible natural resources. Okay. The real reason for this war 
is to rob the people of the Middle East of their most precious commodity and that is their religion, their way of life, their culture, their morals, and that this is the battle line between the forces of good and evil. And I will say that plainly as a follower of the teachings of Jesus. That the Christian world fell a long time ago, folks. It has morphed into a sick mutation of Jewish thinking. And except for a few pockets of resistance, for the most part, it is gone. The only thing that remains is the Islamic world. And it is specifically because the Islamic world refuses to bow down and to adopt these practices, whether they are moral, whether they are cultural, whether they are economic, whether they are political. This is the reason why we are dropping bombs on the countries of these innocent people to further this discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very honored to have with us Sheikh Imran Hussein. I know you told me, Imran, that I should not refer to you as Sheikh, but I think for purposes of uh, decorum here, at least let's start the program off that way. Thank you very much for coming on the program and welcome, sir. Thank you, Glenn, for your very kind invitation. Well, I am here in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia.